I pulled the uh, blade out of heat treat and uh, cleaned up all the patina. Uh, basically, it's just the same process as grinding, just with a finer grit. Take it to the finish that you want. This is a user, so I didn't take it all the way to mirror. Um, and I'm okay with uh, how that came out. So what I want to do now when I've got this apart is I'm going to carbidize here on the lock face. And what we're going to do is deposit a layer of tungsten carbide, and we're using a BB carbidizer. Now that's going to add a thou to three or four thou there. Uh, you're not going to save a knife probably using a, a carbidizer. I know a lot of guys thought that initially when these started taking off. Uh, I've never been able to do that. I have been able to tighten some up uh, with a just a lot of time on there. Now you can uh, cook this lock face, uh, take it up to cherry red, let it cool off, and do that, uh, cycle that three or four times, uh, and you'll harden that face. And the, so the benefit to that is, is you got titanium going against um, steel, and it tends to gall and grab. And when you carbidize it, number one, you're getting a 70 Rockwell uh, face on there with that tungsten carbide, just under diamond hardness. So that helps reduce wear here. And this is going to be around a 62, 61 and a half. This is M390. Pretty hard stuff there. And the titanium is relatively soft, uh, 6AL4V as compared to, say, this. So carbidizing here uh, gives some extra life to this lock face, reduces wear, and it also helps with uh, sticky locks. Now, when you're testing um, your assembly, and uh, you, before the blade is hard, uh, it'll really kind of stick and grab in that um, lock up if you've got the angles right. And it gets really sticky. Now the carbonizing helps with that uh, a bit. And then once the blade is hard, you get that carbonized, a lot of that is cured. Inside of here is transformer and a small circuit. And uh, this is a Dremel engraving tool that the guy buys and converts, runs wire in there. Um, goes on like that, adjusts the vibration. So put a lead there. Doesn't take long. You can't just keep adding it on because at some point it, it, the circuit just gets too weak to really push anything in there. This will wear a bit when, you're, when your uh, knife is brand new. Uh, it'll be a little stickier than you like it. Just keep using it for a little bit and you'll see some slight wear and you'll get a better feel on the lock face as it locks up in there. Now, if you recall when we ground this, um, we were about a 50% lock up. Now I trial fitted this and when it's all together and tight, uh, we're getting a 20-25% lockup, if that. And so the plan always was to come back and touch up this lock face for the final fit up. And with the ramp system, it, it's just a quick touch on there, and we'll get that. And I prefer about a 50% lockup. Leaves plenty of room for wear, and it's not going to pop back on you. I kind of like this stuff. This is black and green layered canvas micarta from Norplex like the stuff. I, I uh, roughed it out with about a 3640 grit to get it shaped and then I came back and smoothed it out a bit with a 120 and I'm going to leave it uh, kind of rough and I'll probably come back and throw some mineral oil in there or WD-40, probably mineral oil. It seems to last a little bit longer than WD-40 and wipe that off and that will really darken all of this up and that's a kind of a final step. I'm not interested in buffing this one. I like the feel. Now you can uh, take this to a 400, 600 grit if you want and buff it and it will have a great look. Um, pretty cool stuff and so a lot of flexibility there but this is going to be a user. So going to leave it that way. Now one of the things when um, I uh, shaped this one, I lost the countersinks here. Now I had countersunk these screws. The, the uh, 
two screws holding the scales, those are countersunk enough. Along this edge, and this is normal in shaping that, to that round over, I lost the countersinks. So what I'm going to have to do is countersink these a little bit more. I don't like how these screws are sticking up like that. It, it, you can't feel it in your hand because it just doesn't grip that way or it's just not a big deal. But still like to get those a little bit uh, lower to the surface. And so we'll go over and countersink. Then also, uh, as long as we're at it, we have to countersink for the pivot head. So we've got these disc pivot heads. I think this is a 435. Yep. And uh, so we'll countersink the pivot heads uh, because this whole thing is going to be pretty thick. And uh, I'll probably end up leaving uh, two, three hundred thou here. These were 316 so they started off around 187, 190. Uh, got a lot of meat in there and uh, you can get down to 300 thou countersink in there. That'll push that head way down in there and get that flush and then we'll come back and dome those over. So when I countersunk I actually used the tip of the pilot on this particular countersink to go down on all these holes and that gave me just the right amount uh, of penetration with the major diameter there and gave me the right countersink. Now I won't be able to do that here because it's just not going to work. So this one I have to just kind of do by eyeball and I'll get that over the, the block. Now this stuff is uh, laid up in layers, so as you're going through, you'll kind of your countersink will just sit there and dwell for a minute, and then all of a sudden that next layer breaks through. And so if you just keep jacking on the pressure there and applying more and more pressure, you're going to just go all the way through. So you, you've got to let it dwell uh, uh, just a little bit, uh, take off some of that hard layer that you're running into uh, without going all the way through. And boy, it just wants to sink quick. This one has a quarter inch pilot, and these, this one has a 316, so I'm gonna move this pilot over to there. That's a 437, so which gives me about a thou or two on either side of the diameter. So we'll switch these pilots over. So these counter bores, these are two piece counter bores, and you can get, a lot of these will have a different uh, diameter shaft right in there. These are commonly found in 332nd. This is a 532nd. Then you'll find larger size, but for knife making, you probably won't get into those sizes. Shaft there. So you've got the diameter, the, uh, lots of dimensions on these. You got the outer diameter of the cutter. Then you've got the diameter of the pilot shaft, and then you've got the diameter of the pilot head. So those go in there. They've usually got a flat side and, and a little set screw right in here. So that goes in there and the set screw tightens it all up. And counter bores are expensive. There's no way around it. You're gonna pay anywhere from 50 on a one piece counter bore, but you can never find the right combination of minor and major diameters on those, or uh, hard to find. Um, so I tend to use these interchangeable ones and it's an investment just like a grinder or other tools it's just what it is but uh, take care of your your counter bores i tend to get carbide they they hold up a little bit longer and we're uh, working in some tough material in titanium or or uh, g10 my car to just eats high speed steel up so there's switched over so it's a little snug but that's going to be okay that'll Spin in there, and I did open these holes up. I drilled these with the 316. Again, that, that micarta tends to shrink around, so I came and followed these up and enlarged that slightly with the number 12, which is 189. A 316 is 1875. So that gave me just another thou and a half, and I kind of wriggled it around. That won't even begin to touch it, so I'm going to have to do this manually. One of the other things that uh, you can do is take a plate like this. This is just some scrap steel we had around. And I drilled a little hole in there, larger than the pilot diameter. So that'll bottom out and ride on that pilot, okay? So it's a hard stop, and I'm gonna check 
there and that's just as much as I want to use. So um, take a piece of scrap, line it up, and you'll be able to go all the way down. You won't have to worry about breaking through or going too far. Famous last words. I bottomed out, give it a tap. Pretty nice countersink in there. Let's take a look at our pilot, our disc head. Way down in there. I can live with that. And uh, I'll probably come back uh, now that I've got this set. I'll take just, I'll relieve that just a little bit more to get flush there. And then I'm still going to come back and uh, probably dome that over. I do like how that looks. So we've got the countersinks there, countersunk there, everything's countersunk. We're, we're getting really close on this thing. So let's go back over and see where we're at. All right, now on the inside, this edge right in here, and that edge right in there, sharp on the hand. You can feel it. Um, we're gonna relieve all of those edges that are exposed on the inside. You wouldn't think you, you would have to but certainly you're gonna feel that in your hand and it's just not comfortable. So we're gonna take and just, uh, we'll run a little bit of uh, slack belt, um, three, 400 grit, just enough to break that edge, take that sharp edge off. There's always burrs that come in. We deburr so many times on the disc grinder that a burr builds up on one side or the other. And I can feel the burr right there. It also interferes with a good fit up this particular case uh, with the scale there. I can feel the burr there. So we're gonna get a deburr and then we're gonna ease the edge. Now we're only gonna do the inside. What we don't wanna do is relieve this outside edge right there because then you're gonna end up with a gap between your scale and that. You do wanna deburr it, get that nice and flat, but we're gonna relieve on the inside here. Also, um, right in there as you open it up, you want um, a nice relief right in there on the lock bar where you're gonna push it over with your thumb or that just gets old after a while. So we're gonna, we'll sand that down and clean that up. Then finally, over here, we've got this uh, detent track. Now most of it's gone from uh, opening it back and forth when it was soft. Now it's hard, now we're just gonna polish that. But right where that line hits on that lock face. I'm going to put a little ramp in there because that ball sticks up quite a bit. That detent ball sticks up quite a bit and I want to give that detent ball a fighting chance to get up and on the surface of the blade here. It just makes for a smoother action. Now as we relieve on that inside edge, I don't want to relieve where the space bar is going to show, otherwise I'll end up with a gap there. So I'm going to mark that and not go any farther back. I'm just going to put these in here to index that. Okay. So I'm going to relieve all the way around on the inside again to just get that and I'll relieve this. Now, depending on how far you take this, you can get a nice light line on there, nice light accent as you as it reflects in the light. So you do want that to be as even as possible and matched all the way. Quick deburr. Now I know from an earlier test fit I had uh, barely any engagement there. This time I'm gonna put a washer in. This may require putting it all together and taking it apart a couple times. Believe me, it's better to be patient on this part of it and do it right than going too far on that and having to make a new blade 
So I've got the lock bar side, got it engaged, and you can see a really small amount of engagement, 10% if that. So I'll go over and take a little bit more off of that, uh, maybe a thou or two, I mean hardly any, I'll use a 120 on this and walk that over so I get about halfway. We're only looking at about a thou or two. I'm going to put it together and check it because that's what you do. Now, if you're putting your scales together and you find that you're trying to put your pivot in and it's off just slightly, put your, leave your scales on, run your reamer back through both as they're attached and that will take care of that. I probably did that earlier, I don't recall, but I usually have to do that. We had uh, sized lengthwise this pivot earlier, so I've got some engagement there, but I'd like a little bit more on the other liner side, so use the threads, bring that out just a touch more. I do know that since I came back and countersunk these a little bit farther in to hide the heads a bit more, that the screws are going to be too long, and so I'll have to trim those to size. All right, that additional countersunk buried those nicely, but I've got 20 thou there to knock off on those, so I'll go take those off quick. Once in a while you'll find that you switch the screws around and because of the not exactly high precision method of countersinking we use, you'll find one of the screws are a little bit longer than the other. The fix is either grind it off or uh, switch your screws around. It's usually not a problem for a maker, but when a customer gets a hold of it, they can't help themselves. They gotta take these things apart and play with them a bit, I guess. Uh, you'll find that they'll get the screws mixed around. Let them know they're going to do that. But occasionally just switching the screws around will take care of any issues. But the idea is to minimize any warranty work that you're going to have down the road. So it's easier to just to grind them flush and there'll be enough thickness in the scales or in the liners to take that into account and you save yourself some, some trouble. Now, if you recall, we had an interference issue with this thumb stud, and when I was, when I had these all together, I spent a little time just moving that down slightly, and we clearance that just fine, and still got enough to hide that, so it looks decent. Now, this is uh, fairly tight. Snug that up. And we've got about a 25% engagement and fairly solid. Okay, so even flicking it out, that engagement is still, now we're up to about 30, 35%. I'm gonna leave that and see how that wears in over a few days. But uh, with some oil in there, get it final tuned. If I need to move it again, I will. There's right at 50%. That's exactly where I want it to be. But no, it's way too tight. Again, I don't have any oil. Now, the deal with these pivots is they're 64 threads per inch versus 56. And so that means uh, you've got eight more rotations uh, in one of these uh, per inch. And 
what you end up with is a lot finer adjustment as you adjust the tension uh, on the washers and so on. The, the 64 pitch thread is going to let you um, align that a lot easier. Some oil in there. It's got a consistent lockup between 30 and 50. And it's not jamming. Go up to a knife maker's table, slam his liner lock open like this, watch his face. He's not gonna like you. Probably not a good idea. So we've got that. We're pretty well centered in the blade there. A little play, but I've got it loose in there. So at this point, I'm kind of okay with this. I'm going to take these uh, heads out, dress these up a little bit, and uh, take it apart. I'll clean up any dust, grit that happened to got in there. I'll give it some oil, and then we'll go sharpen it. But uh, also, I'm going to uh, put my mark on there, and when it's it's just easier to do it when it's all disassembled versus on there i know a lot of guys and myself included normally don't put their mark on until the very last thing after sharpening um it's a choice so uh, but in this case i'm going to just go ahead and get my mark on when it's disassembled i'll run that right there and uh we're close we're just about done with this thing Uh, Joshua just remind me I didn't um, give that a little ramp right there and again you can see where that detent is right in there this is horrible this really bothers me but I'm gonna live with it this is where I I had some junk on there and I touched it with a 36 or a 40 grit put these deep scratches in I hate them they're inside um, again it's a user I wouldn't ever do that on a show knife like that so you want to clean up your titanium you can anodize this if you want but uh, now I've got this carbide tool again this is a 1 8 ball nose sphere nose whatever you want to call it carbide um, bit in there and what I'm going to do is put that little ramp right where that ball is going to go Not much, it's all it takes because you're not sticking up that much. You're sticking up 25, 20 thou on that and I've got more than enough there to just kind of help that uh, detent ball ramp up there. Now I stayed away from where the lockup is. The lockup is right there, you can see the mark. And that's well away from that little ramp and that was part of the design. Okay, so we've got that in there. Now we're going to take these little things and dome them over, and it's pretty low tech. It's got the barrel pivot on there. There we go, off to the grinder. Uh, we have these made out of 416 and then harden them. So they will take a killer shine if that's how far you want to do it. It's kind of a worn 120, and then we'll come back and hit it with a 400. Belt's going this way. This is rotating along with that. I want to rotate against how the belt's going. So that's going to go against it that way.
we are just about ready. I'm going to put the mark on. All right, uh, I had these stencils made at uh, IMG Electro Etch, and that's where we get all of our chemicals and our etchers. And nice and clean. I don't want any oils to act as a resist. Keep my grubby fingers off of there. And I'm going to use this blue tape. I used to use vinyl tape quite often. And uh, in fact, I've even got a tutorial out there that suggests that. I would tell you that maybe switch that to this blue painter's tape. What happens with the vinyl tape is as you lay it over, there's always a little exit seam. And you end up with a mark over there, a mark there, a mark there wherever that vinyl tape channeled liquid and it boy it sure doesn't have to be big you end up with a like a little mark there this blue tape tends to be a little friendlier about that and goes in the little cracks and crevices easier I was talking to Jerry Hossum at Blade last spring talking about knife making and Jerry and I were talking about etching he said this is uh, his very last step and it's the worst part of making a knife for him because of those stray lines or fog or what have you and when etching works it's awesome and when it doesn't quite work it's maddening but a little practice and you, you have uh, less issues over time so I'm going to mask all this off and make sure I get around those little creases so no liquid gets in and surprises me later flat it's straight as I can make it I won't I don't need to mass that off there's nothing out there that's going to get anything so I've got it pressed down all the way around no leaks hopefully we sell a smaller version of this this is a bigger version we can also get this one to you I don't know that we normally even carry these in stock but we can get them turned around pretty quick uh, basically same thing as the smaller version just a couple more amps power and I don't even use that it, it was just handy and there it is. The whole deal with getting a deep edge is there's got a lot of little fibers that stick out. And those fibers actually go through the screen. This is just like a t-shirt uh, screen print if you ever did that. Uh, and scrub that in there and those little fibers go through the mesh and remove the metal. And that's on the DC setting. So we'll switch that to DC. Put my power on. Hook up my lead. 